Welcome to Combat Sports Talk, a podcast dedicated to UFC and Bellator discussion, the MMA community, and combat sports in general. I'm your host, Ryan Smith, and joining me this week is KC Onye Bucci and John Keyes. Well, no crazy introduction. Not KC, the best person I've ever met. Definitely not that. Yeah, all right. KC, (laughs) the strongest man I've ever met. I did that one before. Wow. Ah, oh, that's fair. <laughs> well, I should have at least come in with a random voice. I haven't done that in a while. You haven't. And John Keys. Yes, I am. See, you know what I didn't do, John? Yeah, I know what you didn't do, and I appreciate the mercy that you have, you have shown. I see. I'm not showing you mercy because I'm gonna go right into it now. Uh, oh my goodness! Yeah, I know. It's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go John ahead. John Keys. Uh, you know, I'll give you glory. Yeah, the I'll man. Give you glory who uh-huh. failed on four separate occasions to face uh-huh. me on the field of battle with Street Fighter 2, his weak fighter, Vega, versus the strongest woman in the world, Chun-Li. He had to. All I got to say. Eat all I that got to crow. Say about this. Uh, uh, is it a loss or a no contest? It's a no contest. The angels were watching over. Let him, me just okay? say, they did not. <laughs> this they did no not contest. want him to catch them hands. All That's I gotta say is that even if he got the environment to work, it still wouldn't have been a contest. I would have blown his doors off. I would have beat him. So it doesn't You're matter, right. fight or no fight, working or not working, you're gonna lose. <laughs> and just like. The world may try to find out how many licks it takes to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll pop. The world may never know. May never okay. know. I'm like, we're going to have to just find like an arcade somewhere and just do it there. Like, I don't know. You know there, I'll do a shameless plug. Uh, there is a place in Richardson called Free Play. Okay. We can take it down there. And you know what? Even after you play the game and I've beaten you like 20 times, 20, you know, 20 zip. I even buy you a drink afterwards, okay? Because you're gonna need it. No, uh, okay. Oh, you can. Like, like, <laughs> I thought you were gonna accept the challenge. Like, come on now, Barcadia. No, 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 no. I'm yeah. just, I'm just saying. It's like we. We have we have lots of tape of you talking trash. What we don't have yeah. is any action whatsoever. So you know, and I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure case. what will happen is we will schedule a day to go down to the arcade, and your car will not work. You will get a flat tire. <laughs> you will you will get stopped by the police. Something's gonna happen, and I'm gonna be sitting there in front of this arcade, going, "This is no contest number five. This and, is like it's know, like Lou Vega's remix." Gonna stop us at this point. Like I said, the angels follow you right now, okay? Because they don't want to see it happen. You, you know, like I said, your wife and your kids must be doing something right because they don't want to lose their, their their patriarch. They don't want to lose the <laughs> I the, we were the, going the, the, the breadwinner. Talk real quick. I'm gonna have to <laughs> yeah. talk real quick. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All I got to say is we, we, we have we have plenty of information that says John talks a big game, but he has Aww. yet to deliver. So all I got to say is that if 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 going to going down to Richardson, Texas, to find an arcade that plays this game is the only way that I can finally prove what we already know is that I'm better than you at this game, then let's just do it. Let's do it. Let's find a time. Let's schedule a time and do it. But th- then again, that's what I said in the last show, and then it, and, and it didn't happen. All right, let's get You're into confident. Let's, <laughs> let's get into the real show. The UFC descended onto Madison Square Garden for UFC 230, Cormier versus Lewis, a heavyweight fight that would cement Cormier as the only UFC champ to hold and defend two titles at the same time. Chris Favorite Weidman, champ, champ. the champ champ. Chris Weidman no, the returned. Paper after, champ, champ. All right. The people <laughs> champ champ. You got any other champ champs? Yeah, the paper champ champ. What? What? He's not the real champ. I, I, he is the He is the real champ. Yeah. He's defended the I belts. I think there's a lot of people with some. I think there's a lot of choked out people and beat up people that, you know, can, can attest for that. Yeah. You know? Let's see what Jones has to say about that. Uh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Jones keeps on, saying it's his belt. They, 
But I saw the press yeah. conference. Jones did like there were four people on the stage, but only two of them had belts, and John Jones was mm-hmm. not one of those people. So was there a two hundred six mm. uh, pound belt on the on the, uh, on the stage? Uh, yes. Well, well, no, because Daniel Cormier wasn't there. <laughs> But if he was there, there is a 206-pound belt. It's called the heavyweight belt, which he holds. Yeah. Bam. All right, so what happened in the garden? Well, well did you know that Chris you- Weidman returned after a long layoff, and he faced Jacare Souza, who's a dangerous striker and submission specialist, who was a late fight replacement for Luke Rockhold, who got injured right before the fight. But before we go into all of the storylines that colored the UFC event at Madison Square Garden— <laughs> Let's get right into the official decision. The official decision. This is the official decision. This is where we look at the results from Saturday night. There were great, great fights on this card. The first fight of the night was Israel Adesanya, who defeated Derek Brunson via TKO in round one. Good old Israel is real. Definitely called this match and all of the other ones, except for the last, correctly. The Nostradamus of MMA continues his streak. The Nostradamus. There you go. (laughs) I can smell victories. (laughs) All I'm going to say is that to call it a TKO is, is, is putting it mildly. I would have called it a dissection and a <laughs> clinic and a, and, a, and a thesis paper on how to beat somebody up really bad after they talk trash. Yeah, I mean, you, you, know? you know, what What was funny is that we were watching it. Where we watch it is a place called Austin Avenue. It's it's in Plano. Mm-hmm. And they put the fight on, but it's on uh, direct TV. And so a – Line of storms blows right over, over the the bar, and so all of the, all of the the screens go out, and so we're watching oh. the fight. They're circling. Adesanya's you know throwing strikes and things like that. Everything goes out, and then when it comes back, he's got his hands up. He's climbing the cage, <laughs> and we're like, wait, what? <laughs> you missed like a million knockdowns. So, yeah, exactly. so we had to watch it on replay because it was like we missed all the action. But yeah, I mean, Derek Brunson was he? You know, he had that. My favorite thing when a, someone gets knocked out, they ask, "What happened?" And he was like looking yeah. at the ref, going, "Like, what? What happened? Why'd you, you stop the fight?" <laughs> Exactly, and, you know that's how that's how it went, and it was it was it was it was perfect. It was a perfect technical clinic. Yeah, I mean, you know, and it, it wasn't even. I mean, and you know, call me crazy if you watched the if you watched the guy striking. Crazy. Okay, Israel Israel wasn't really hitting him with power punches. It was just straight punches, jabs. You know, he was just really just hitting him in precise spots to make you lose control of your body. You know, and it was just. It was it was it was beautiful. I had to say, you know? yeah. So so yeah. I think what's what's interesting is that now that he's beaten Derek Brunson, you know, we now need to start thinking about what's next for this young man because the I, I can I can see that at this point talent can get real thin real fast. That's going to be able to put a, a challenge in front of him. He's going to have to start facing some of the some of the you know the elite fighters at, at 185 pounds because. Um, I thought that was going to be a test, and it, he it, he looked like he was given the answers long before he sat down to take that test. Yeah, definitely. Um, it might come down to the point of uh, not who he's going to fight, but who wants to fight him now. And I don't see too many people that's going to be trying to run up on him. Well, you know, that reminds me of someone else who had that problem. But we'll get to that a little bit later in the show. Um, The next fight of the night, Carl Robertson defeated Jack Marshman via unanimous decision. This this was a great fight. It was a unanimous decision. Robertson was all over him. I mean, he just put on a clinic, just whooped Jack Marshman, the Welsh dragon. 
I feel like after right. a loss, you, you've got to change your name because the Welsh dragon. Well, I don't think that's his real name. He was just, oh. he's Welsh. And so the flag has a dragon. So there you go. I, I just, <laughs> no, you just got to change that. You, I, don't, you, I don't really think his nickname is the Welsh dragon. It's something like. <laughs> something I don't know. Like, my name is Jack and I'll be back. <laughs> oh, my, my. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a great oh. fight. Um, a lot of people didn't, ha- you know, hadn't seen Carl uh, Robertson. Robertson was a uh, uh, someone that they found at the Tuesday night Dana Contender Series. So, um, I mean, this is a guy that uh, showed that he's got dynamic striking. He's got lots of great um, agility. It just put put it on Marshman, and uh, Marshman is is a bit of a veteran in the in, in you know in the in the sport. Um, but he had nothing for Carl Robertson that night. Let's go on to the next one. Um, Jared Cannonier defeated David Branch via TKO in round two. This is one that I thought was going to go Branch's way. I mean, Branch put on a great performance versus Tiago Santos uh, prior to this fight. He's coming in against the guy who's a late fight replacement. And, I mean, all of this is like lining up for David Branch to have a great night. And Jared Cannonier was like, I'll leave the light on for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this guy was yeah. like, Jared did not get the memo that David Branch was supposed to win this fight because after David Branch tried to take him down and failed and tried to take him down and failed and tried to take him down and failed, him down and failed Jared's like, okay, I'm about done with this. Let's just finish this fight. Get to round two. Black cow. And then it was, Branch was rocked, got finished. And Jared Cannonier is now on the scene. And the sad part about that, did you see his, did you see Branch's face when he was getting those elbows while he was on the ground? It was that of just like, what has just happened? And, you know, as he's getting blasted and finally the ref pulled him off and it was just, it was sad. It was, I mean, nothing get, and I had David Branch winning that. And yeah, me too. for all reasons, you know, all Stakes and purposes, he should have won. But you know, that's the name of the game. You know, just when you think you got all the answers, they go and change the questions. But and this well, is that was definitely one that got changed up on brand. Well, one one that I think is an, another example of that is the next fight, Jacare Souza knocks out Chris Weidman in the third round. I have to say. I, I I wish you know when we do the when when George and I do the live show we don't record during the actual fight so we 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 record to the lead up of the fight when the fighters get into the ring we stop the recording and then we record after if you could have heard me during this fight because I had Chris Weidman I was the only like I think I was the only one on Chris Weidman Chris Weidman's winning this fight this whole fight he's got Jacare bloodied potential broken nose Jacare is throwing bombs just to try to try try to finish this fight and Chris is just dodging them and then I'm like why is Chris still engaging it's a third round I think he's got the first two rounds he's throwing jabs he's got got Jacare on the end of his punches why is he trying to throw trying to do Muay Thai clinches and throw knees like what is what is going on there he's keeping himself in range of these crazy powerful Jacare Souza punches and he's gonna get hit and I'm yelling out I'm, I'm, I'm literally sitting in the middle of the restaurant yelling he's going to get knocked out if he keeps blow and it's like <laughs> oh uh, and he got knocked out. He got knocked out. You should have been pretty such happy. A shame. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't hear. I don't. You know, I, I hear you saying it's a shame, but I'm not detecting any sincerity in your voice there. Not a bit. Okay. <laughs> not one iota of sincerity. Okay. He, could, well, you know, I, I would say it like this: He thought he thought he was all of that, and then he went against Jacare. He was and he, he got was what he got. whooping Jacare. He was but you know putting it to him. Jacare was not yeah. winning that fight. If he would not have gotten that knockout, Jacare would have lost by unanimous decision. That I'm not going to call it a lucky punch because he was throwing it all night. It was bound to land at some point. 
I am just so frustrated with Chris Weidman that he didn't see this coming. He didn't have the situational awareness to be able to say, I'm up on the cards. I've got this guy bloodied. All I got to do is keep him on the end of my punches and I win this fight. And he failed to do so. Like, I, I, I would love to be able to find out what Ray Longo and Matt Serra said to Weidman after this fight. It's got to be, you idiot. I, I, I gotta, I, I'm got sure I, I know what they said. And because this is, a fan, this is supposed to be a family-friendly show... Yeah, I, I don't think we're gonna we're gonna repeat those okay. words. But All right. Yeah. I, I two just, things. Two things yeah. I want to mention out there. All right. Two things I do want to put out there. One, mad props to Jacare for when he when he did you know separate you know Weidman's conscious from his body that he stopped. Okay, because he, he he knew that he was out. Poor form. On on the ref on, on Mergliata because it looks like he probably wanted to get he wanted to kill Wyman which I'm not really mad at him for wanting that but it's just like dude do better okay he wanted them to continue fighting and Jacques Array was like no he's out don't you see this yeah. and you could and even I was felt a little sad for that for Wyman because yeah. he was like he was just like he was struggling to grab for for a leg for you know for for a single leg and it was just like dude come on. Yeah, it yeah. was it was pretty was bad. Awesome. Yeah. Go ahead. That was I, I don't think that was even uh intelligent defense. That was just muscle memory kicking in. Oh yeah, you could see. Yeah, I think so. So, you know, we I I was sending uh text messages to KC earlier today because back on episode 4, we're on episode 71. So, so, you know, uh 67 episodes ago, we talked about wow. the, the different types of knockouts. And this was a classic type two knockout, which was a timber. I mean, at one minute, you know, Chris Weidman is up. He gets hit and it's just like a, a tree falling in the forest. He hits the ground and he's looking up. And that's when he realizes, oh, crap, I'm not looking at my opponent anymore. I'm looking at lights. I better grab for something. <laughs> yep. And so he yeah. he grabs for Jacare's foot. And he, I mean, he's literally got him around the ankle and and. And Mergliata is looking at it, looking at Jacare going, I didn't call this fight. And so it, it's it's the most awkward thing in the world because you got Jacare Souza, who, who's clearly he sees that his opponent is is knocked out. But because Chris Weidman grabbed for his foot, like you said, uh, KC, with muscle memory, he's got to continue fighting. So he he like bends down, throws a couple of hammer fists and and then he looks at Mergliata again going, seriously, do you want me to keep going? And that's when Mergliata stops the fight, and then Chris Weidman grabs Mergliata by the foot. Yeah, like I, I, I hope I, I hope they have a talking to him with about that because you've got to have the awareness. Protect the fighter. Hashtag protect the fighter. And they didn't. Fight. <laughs> he didn't do that. Yeah, Mergliata trying to get people killed. That's all that was. Yeah, at uh, least some CTE or something. Well, in the final fight of the night, the main event of the evening, Daniel Cormier defeated Derek Lewis via submission in round two. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that this is kind of like Mutual of Omaha. When you see the little ailing wildebeest and you see the lion come up, it's like, yeah, you know, maybe that wildebeest can get away. But then you're like, mm, and the next thing they come back after commercial and the lion is just feasting on the wildebeest. This is what it was. It was as academic as nature gets. Daniel Cormier took Derek Lewis down, used his superior wrestling, got a, got took his back, and then submitted him with a rear naked choke. I mean, it was I, – I, I, I didn't see it going any other way. I mean, who picked Dan, uh, Derek Lewis? The smartest man in the business. <laughs> so we're gonna crow on this, but not every other pick you got wrong. No, because the main event is the crow call. You get the you get the crow if you miss yeah. the main event. That's the way it goes. <laughs> I mean, I knew Daniel Cormier was going to win. Did, did you know Daniel Cormier was going to win, John? Yeah, it was kind of the writing was on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so yeah, you know, <laughs> that's, that's kind of right there. <laughs> I mean, no, that's no. the fight that stunk. If anything, the Nostradamus was going to detect that one. 
I was uh, like, you know, if, he, if he didn't see that coming, man, I, I wouldn't advise ever walking around looking at your phone. Okay, I'm just saying that. It was, it was pretty obvious, man, okay? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. I mean, we agree on a lot of things over there, man. I mean, it's, you know, it's just, okay, so, this one was just... Let me be honest. It's it's really, really easy for me to say that I saw this coming in the sense that, like, yes, there is um, so many more skills that Cormier's bring into the to the fight. He's his, his grappling is going to be infinitely better. Uh, he can hold his own on cardio side. So, yeah, all of that's there. But I w- I always have to give Derek Lewis his puncher's chance. And the fact is, like, he, he was taking. Uh, the worst possible fight for him on short notice. That's this was clearly just a fight set up so that Cormier could be in their history books. Yeah, and there was money involved. Okay, yeah. and just oh, yeah. like uh, it was guaranteed and, money. And this, I watched the interview. It's guaranteed money for Derek Lewis. So he's like, "Listen, if yeah. I win, half a mil is great. If I lose, yeah. it's fine because it's guaranteed money." And yeah, I mean that's. That's great. It's it's great. Plus, he got that Popeye sponsorship. You know, oh, sure, yeah. he got more fans. Uh, he's he's just a lovable guy. I don't have anything bad to say about Derek Lewis. You know, to be honest, um, he he just seems like that normal guy that you just go and you know shoot the breeze with on a Sunday afternoon. But I mean, there was no way that he was gonna. I mean, I can't say no way because okay. he does have. I, that's why I'm correcting myself. He does have the puncher's chance, but I, I, you know, nine times out of ten, he, 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 this is what happens. So, um, and just like Carmier said, if he, if the puncher's chance is all he had, he was in, uh, he was in there for the wrong, for all the wrong reasons. Okay, he, you know, Carmier. Let's put it out there: Carmier is the best heavyweight fighter there is. Period. Mm-hmm. Stipe Miocic might have Whoa. something to say about that. Kane Velasquez. I mean, there are you know, some people. Kane that. isn't fighting, though. Kane isn't fighting. Okay. I will say it right now. The, he, you know, as long as DC is there, Kane won't fight. Okay. I feel he like will we're, not fight. Maybe when DC leaves, you know, Kane will come back. I feel but like. Right now. See. What? You know, right now. Huh? I mean, with steroids, of course, but Verdum could beat DC. Verdum? Oh God! Yeah. It, uh, to be honest, that would be an interesting fight. It to uh, Fabricio Verdum would be a much more interesting fight for me than 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 Derek Lewis. The only problem is Fabricio yeah. is currently being suspended for his for for being pop with PEDs. Um, Fabricio creates a, a problem for Daniel Cormier on the ground because you've got this big guy who knows who's an expert in jujitsu. Um, so you're going to have to keep it standing and. Frankly, I don't think Daniel Cormier wants a stand-up fight with with uh, Fabricio Verdum. Not because Verdum has great striking; it's because Daniel Cormier's hand is is super fragile. That's why I think the Derek Lewis yeah. fight was a great fight for him because he didn't have to throw very hard punches. He knew he was going to go for a submission and take down a submission, so he didn't have to throw like bombs. He just had to do enough to get Derek uh, Derek Lewis to to not defend the takedown. So if he has a super fragile hand, what's going to happen between him and Brock? That's going to be interesting. Well, I, I think that what's going to happen between him and Brock is that the the reason why the Brock fight is is so delayed is into 2019, you know, sometime March, I would assume, is because of the mm-hmm. fact that he wants his hand to heal. Um, so he got one fight in that didn't put his hand in danger. He's still resting it and trying to get it to heal. And it's his last fight. So if he breaks his hand again, you don't have to worry about it. It's gonna it's gonna heal, and he's gonna go back into the commentary commentary role, either in the UFC or MMA, or uh, I guess he wants to do WWE commentary, which blows my mind. The whole thing is a mess. Like basically, this is yet another shot for uh, uh, for someone who doesn't deserve a title shot to get one. Like, oh, I I can't. I I I can see a case for both the reasons why he shouldn't and why he should. Okay. You know, why he shouldn't because he got, he got beat the last time he, he got beat decisively the last time that he had a, a title defense. Okay. He did come back. Fought, fought and we're Mark talking Hunt, about Brock, Brock Lesnar, right? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah we are talking about Brock. doesn't deserve it at all. Yeah. You know, but he's such a draw. That's the reason why it's a money decision here. Why he's doing why. it. Yeah, I get that. You know. I, I and, think that's why you have put to out that, sleeping. And let's put it out there. You know, who, I mean, let's put, I'll be honest. I don't think there's anybody in the heavyweight division that can give him, that can give DC a serious run for his money except for Brock. I'm going to raise my hand. I'll say that. I'm going to raise my hand and say Curtis Blades. I believe in that fella right there. I believe that Curtis Blades could 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 give Daniel Cormier a run for his money. I do. Um, I'm excited to see Curtis Blades come back into action, you know, uh, before the end of the year. I think it's either early December or it's at the, it's at the 232 fight. Um, I, I, that we are going to see what this guy can do and, you know, the work that he put in on Alistair Overeem. And I know the list of people who beat Alistair Overeem is fairly long, but I mean, he literally sliced Overeem open and had him bleeding all over the place. This is a guy who's got wrestling. He's got the size, the agility, the striking. That's the kind of guy that I think would give Daniel Cormier a a run for his money. And I think it's unfortunate that Daniel Cormier has one fight left in him. It's the money fight versus Brock Lesnar. And then he's going to see the sunset of his career. Uh, Because I think, I I believe that Curtis Blades is going to be a champion someday. Um, Oh, I agree. Okay. It sounded like you had another yeah, point to that's make. It. That's it? Okay. Well, I agree. Well, I'll say it like this. I agree, but it wouldn't have been made by Cormier. You would have to fight somebody else. Cormier, <laughs> you know, you're right. As for everything that Blades has, Cormier has something that Blades don't have, and that is experience. Cagey, nasty, in the trench, bloody mud experience. Got it. Let's right. le- let let let's go ahead and close the book on this one. Let's put it on the shelf because this card is history. And let's look to the train yard to see some trains that are pulling out of the station with the hype train. The hype train. This is the Hype Train. This is the segment where we look at the fighters who had great fights on Saturday night and decide if we're going to be people who were jumping on that bandwagon, what we call the Hype Train. First one on the list, Israel Adesanya. Now, we've already expressed that we are on the Adesanya Hype Train, but there's a lot of people who say that he is the next John Jones, and that, I think, is a Hype Train worth revisiting. Do you think that Israel Adesanya is the next John Jones? Are you buying into the hype? Are you getting on that Hype Train? John? Uh, John Jones? No. Um, Anderson Silva? Yes. Ooh. Oh, so he's going to have uh, pills that disqualify him for a couple of years? Exactly, right? But what, <laughs> oh, not until he reaches 40. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then he breaks his leg in a freak accident or, you know, or that's like that. The right. rock. <laughs> All right, cynical people here. Do you, are, you, are you buying the, the uh, next John Jones for Israel Adesanya, Casey? I'm going to respect Israel and not call him the next John Jones because he also does not like to be called John Jones. But as far as a dominant fighter who can beat you in multiple styles, whose striking is next level and he is fun to watch, a charismatic, uh, charismatic, uh, charismatic character, the dude has all of the tangible and intal- intangible assets needed to be a star. All right. Um, I'm not going to get on the hype train for calling him uh, John Jones either. Uh, I, I do see a lot of similarities, but, you know, for some reason, I feel like Israel Adesanya is his own person. And I think he's going to have the success that John Jones had without all of the failures. True. True. Yeah. True. There you go. All right, Carl Robertson, this guy coming out of the Contender Series, jumping all over Jack Marshman. I. Are you guys on this hype train? Is this guy legit? John? He might be legit, but I, I need to see a little bit more. I see, I need more. 
That's I, I needed to be. I, I need to see another fight, another fight where he uh, against somebody that's established, and let's see if he's if he if he's the real deal there. KC, one hundred percent agree. I feel like there should be a four fight minimum before anyone can jump on your hype train. Oh. Okay. I mean, because there's too many flashes in the pan, like people who like, oh, okay, you had this awesome performance. And then two fights later, it's there are nobody. Okay. All right. That's fair. Yeah. You know, for me, I was, I was really surprised to see, uh, to, to, to see what he did. Um, I, I don't perceive, uh, Jack Marshman as a high level fighter. I, I want to see more from Carl Robertson, but you know, let me say I'm standing on the platform. I've got a ticket. I'm just waiting for him to, uh, to have another performance like that one. And I'll be ready to punch that one. Next fighter, Jared Cannonier coming in late fight replacement, put in some work in on David branch. John, uh, let me see him do a full camp and then face somebody. And I'll, I'll come back with a better answer. I am here for it. What does that mean? 100%. I am on the, the bandwagon, the train, the hype train, the the hot air balloon, because people are so cool. <laughs> All of it. All right. All right. I, I got to say this. You know, I, I made a commitment to, you know, that – I would try to get on the hype trains of fighters who were local. This guy is from Dallas, Texas, so I am on the Jared Cannonier hype train. You go. You go and fight. Rumble, young man, rumble. <laughs> All right. And the last one. Dan. Oh. What? Nothing. <laughs> Dan. What was that? <laughs> he was getting ready to do some Muhammad Ali impression and then thought better of it. No, all right. So you guys, I, know, I told you guys I was going to multitask a little bit, and I'm on Instagram and just saw someone like fall off of a table and hit their head at that moment. I was like, I probably should have been locked in. Yeah, yeah. How about how about you? Uh, how about you stay on the podcast? Well, I'm doing stuff for our show. Y'all check out combat uh, at Combat Sports Talk on Instagram. Oh, brother! Now I'm nervous. <laughs> Shameless plug, man. I love it. I love it. Come on now. All right. We'll see what he's doing. Daniel (laughs) Cormier. You know, every time Daniel fights, the GOAT conversation comes up. He's currently the number one pound-for-pound fighter in the UFC. Is Daniel Cormier the GOAT? Anybody on that hype train? Nope. Yes. Oh. I am. I am. Hey, sir. Let's hear why you're on that hype train. Um, he has consistently, time after time, put in the work. He has he's, he's made the results. The o- the only time he has he's been beaten has been against roided monsters. Okay, <laughs> so I mean, if you 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 take that away, okay, I don't care what anybody says about you know about the, the PDU. He fights non PD. He's never been popped. He has always been a professional. He is a, he is a marketer. He, he, he can't hype up his own fights. What more do you need this man to do? Okay. Hey, I just have to correct you because the only time that he's been beaten was he's beaten by a guy who was not popped for PEDs because the other fight was a no contest. And frankly, if we're not counting no contests, then, you know, you can't count John Jones. If you count John Jones, then I, I think Chun Li is 4 0. Just saying. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> okay. Well, you know what? I'm sure I <laughs> jump. You got to stop Ryan before he gets on a roll. Woo! I, I know. We're gonna have to stop this, man. He, he is literally. <laughs> yeah, we're, this is this is almost becoming. Yeah, he's got the maniacal laugh there. Oh my God! Oh, okay. All right. All right. Apparently, we have to we have to snip this emperor in the bud. I, okay. You know what? I, I I I am I am ready to say that Daniel Cormier is. The greatest heavyweight fighter um, in the UFC, uh, you know, and I know Stipe Miocic is like, uh, but Stipe Miocic didn't get out of the first round with with with, with Daniel Cormier, um, and so three time defenses. You didn't face Daniel Cormier, and when you did, you gave up the belt. You can't call yourself the greatest heavyweight. I'm sorry. Um, exactly. 
when you look at what he's done at light heavyweight, I think that the John Jones is problematic. So it's hard as, it's hard for me to call him the greatest of all time. Um, so I'm going to say no that Daniel Cormier, at least at this point for me, is not the greatest of all time. Even though if, if DC is listening to this, I love to watch you fight. You're a great promoter. You're great on the screen. I, everything you do is great. Hashtag butt. Uh. <laughs> let's, not, let's not get that one trending. <laughs> I feel like you should not search that hashtag. Yeah, it's let's one not do T. That one. It's only one T. <laughs> but yeah, see what had happened. Uh, what I feel had, like that's yeah. a better hashtag. See what had happened. Okay. Was. All right, all the trades <laughs> have left the station. Let's go into finding the angles. This is Fighting the Angles. This is where we look at the headlines that are making waves in the wake of UFC 230. The first one I wanted to get out of the way is there was a lot of press conferences at uh, at, at the fight at UFC 230, primarily the one that was promoting um, UFC 232, which was John Jones versus Alexander Gustafson scheduled for December 29th. And so Breck Akimoto via ESPN reported that Dana White wanted to have John Jones fight at Madison Square Garden in UFC 230 instead of Daniel Cormier. Now, have, have you guys heard this? Nope. I did hear about this earlier today, and whatever. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't going to happen. Well, I know for a fact that Cormier was, was, was trying to see, trying to seal his legacy because it was, it, was, it was talk that it was he wanted – uh, Daniel Cormier and John Bones Jones to have a fight in Madison Square Garden. Cormier, as much as he against wants to each beat other? him, he is, yes, against each other. He wanted him to go to heavyweight and fight him, and it wasn't going to happen. That's the that was the rumor I saw earlier. I believe it was a uh, MMA Today on YouTube. But that was happening. I had to look it up. Yeah. yeah, John Jones said that he wasn't in shape for to for, to fight that soon. That uh, that he wanted more time to prepare, and uh, that's why they put the fight at uh, at the end of the year instead of you know in the um, in, you know at, at, at UFC two thirty. I, I believe it. You know, the guy's been on uh, hasn't been training. You know, full full force hasn't been sparring and all of that stuff since he was uh, you know he was suspended. So I think it's realistic to say that if if you know his suspension ended in October, um, fighting in early November is probably not a practical thing. I think that's realistic. Okay, I agree. Yeah, uh, I agree. I mean, gotta get the timing back and everything like that. So yeah. So at that UFC 232 press conference, John Jones was in rare form. I thought that him coming back, having Chris Cyborg and Amanda Nunes, Alexander Gustafson, they're all on stage. Reporters are rapid fire questions at him. And I thought he did really well answering questions, addressing questions around lessons he's learned in um, in you know, with, with, with being popped by PEDs, the answering questions about Daniel Cormier and all of those kind of things. I, I thought he did really well in in his return up until we get to the face offs. And then John Jones is facing off against Alexander Gustafson. You know, they face off, they hold that pose for a few minutes for people to get pictures, and then they turn and they face the you know, they both face forward and then John Jones decided he's going to step in front of Alexander Gustafson. Alexander Gustafson decides he's going to step in front of uh, John Jones. And then John Jones pushes him out of the way. And we, we, we get the, the formation of, of, of a melee when Dana White jumps in, breaks them up, and then everything calms down. Uh, overstated. Come on, it was never going to turn into a melee. They, they there was nah. a push, and then they and and then they begin to rush at each other. No, they did. not Okay, let let's let's put this out. Let's let's put this to rest. A true melee was between Cormier and John Bonzel. They proved yeah. one thing more than anything. 
that if they wanted to get to each other, there was nobody that was going to stop them from doing it. Okay. Yep. So every time I see a little, a little push in the seven, I'm like, it's just hype because these guys have been training. They're super strong. They're going to knock whomever is, is in their way out of the way to get to whomever they're going to get to, especially John Jones. He's already proven. He was, he threw, he threw a poor little guy. He just threw him away. Like it was a sack of potatoes to take, to take Cormier down. So, yeah, okay. That was just a hype. Okay, all right. Yeah. I, I, no media danger. All right, the other story, and, and I, you know, I normally shy away from this, but it just struck me every time I watch highlights from the press conference. I, it, just, it just struck me as noteworthy. Chris Cyborg, did you see her? Yes. Like You're cold-blooded in the game for it. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just – no. I, I, uh, no, I'm just I'm just saying. Every, every time Chris Cyborg has a press conference, she's usually dressed in 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 street clothes, jeans, you know, maybe a t shirt, whatever. Like she was completely done up to the nines. Like she went and had a makeover before coming to the to the press conference, and I I didn't look to see, but I wonder how many how many people commented on. Her masculinity, because of course, uh, Chris Cyborg has a you know very chiseled face, you know lots of muscle, and so every time Chris Cyborg does a, a press conference or any type of interview, people are malicious in their in their mockery of of of, of her physique, and seeing her on stage completely done up, makeup, hair, she's in a dress, she's wearing heels, like. She didn't look like the normal Chris Cyborg. She looked like Chris Santos. <laughs> okay. Lucy Lawless. All right. Lucy Lawless. Everybody knows who she is. She's Zena. Zena Warrior she Princess. She played on Battlestar. Yeah, you have the Warrior Princess. Okay. Now, I used to watch Zena back in the day. And sometimes I would look at Lucy Lawless and be like, you know what? She's looking up. Awfully, awfully good looking right now. That, that's a hot woman. And then there's sometimes you look at her and you're like, oh my God, you know, that is now, nah, I'm good, really. There's nothing that you can do for me, okay? Chris Cyborg will never look good to me, okay? I'm sorry. She, I mean, she, no, no. She, she was Chris Cyborg. She was the I'm going to say it. I'm just going to I'm going to say it. You're going to get mad. Don't, don't do All it. Right. Don't I'm do about, it. I, 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 don't do it. Axe murder and heels. Okay. That's all I'm going to say. Axe murder and heels. Okay. That's all I'm saying. What, what I like about Chris Cyborg is she's, she's coming into her own. She doesn't care anymore about the criticism. Yeah. She knows that it's going to be there. And if you've seen what she's been doing on social media and what she does in her normal life, She's become more active, more present, more. She she's putting herself out there, and, and that includes every act aspect of herself. So she's living a more wholehearted life. Which, I mean, I appreciate that a fighter is being more than just a fighter. She's getting it done in the octagon, one hundred percent. But she's oh, actually yeah, living yeah. her best life. So, like, whatever she looks like, I, I'm here for it. Like, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I'm here for it. 100. I, I I I agree, but you know, the the thing for me is just that I have read so many comments about how many people make fun of Chris Cyborg, and it, it for me it was just a different look, and I I at least saw her in a, in a different light as that you know you know like this. I mean, it, it, I. I'd like to think that other people refrained from comments that were negative about Chris Cyborg after seeing this. And and I'm not saying that mm-hmm. every time she does a press conference now she needs to have the full makeup and thing done. But it, it was it, it was stark to me because you have Amanda Nunes on the other side with a with a with a beanie cap on and like a you know a a a, a vest and you know and she's looking like she always looks. And then you have Chris Cyborg who looks like a Brazilian Holly Holm walking up there. <laughs> yeah, it's 
It's yeah, okay. Good. They okay. They needed this contrast. They, I mean, it they, was they, it was a stark contrast, and I I appreciated it. I mean, so I, I'm not saying you know that I was attracted to Chris Cyborg or anything like that. No, all I'm saying is I have watched a ton of Chris Cyborg interviews, and I've seen her do these press conferences, and every time guys are making jokes and. I didn't see a single joke made and maybe they were making jokes and maybe I just missed them all, but I didn't see any jokes. I didn't see any snickers. Chris Cyborg well, did something different that night and I appreciated it. Well, see, it's not that she did it. It's just been a long time since she's done that. Cause she used to wear dresses back in the day, back when uh, she was married, that she used to wear a lot of dresses then. And, you know, she would show a more, a, a more feminine side to her. But when, when she got divorced, and she really focused on her training, it's like she kind of went away from that. And I think that's the reason why people were making so much, you know, with, with ridicule her, because she, she trained to become this monster fighter, okay, that is a dominant, that's really not even a fighter anymore, but a force of nature. And when people see fierce fighters like that, that they don't understand, that they tend to make fun of. Okay, which is why I believe that 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 she's doing more on social media now than she's ever be, she's ever done before, so she can humanize herself. Okay, because if you stay in, in mystery and all the uh, the only exposure that most people have of you is you beating the crap out of somebody in the ring, you know, within a minute of the match, then yeah, they're gonna that people are gonna ridicule you because they don't understand you. The woman is actually quite funny. Okay, if you actually if you actually look at her social media, she's she's she is humorous, and you got to respect a fighter like that that can keep a brutality on that level and still have a sense of humor. Hey guys, I wanted to go and and revisit the John Jones. <laughs> I, I got nothing else to say. <laughs> I wanted to revisit the John Jones <laughs> asterisk conversation from last week because we were all oh, going boy. around the horn about John Jones and asterisk. And um, whether or not his career should have an asterisk based upon his being popped. KC, you said no, John. You said yes. And I was somewhere yeah. in the middle, but ultimately I said yes. I've, I thought about it some more, and I wanted to get, uh, I wanted to revisit this and say his career should not have an asterisk, but that fight against Daniel Cormier should. Um, because at the end of the day, he. If whether or not he was using performance enhancing drugs or not, the you know his defeat of Alexander Gustafson, he did not get popped for uh, popped for PEDs. So why would we put an asterisk on that? Why would we put an asterisk on his fight versus Chael Sonnen or his fight against Hafi, uh, uh, Shogun Hua or M- Leota Machida? That ultimately the only one that he got popped for was the fight against. Uh, Daniel Cormier. So, so you're going to maintain your notion of he's been cheating the whole time. He just happened to get caught. No, I, this- I, I'm, I'm stepping away from that. And, and, and that's the thing is, is that you, we can, we can suggest that he's been cheating the whole time and only got caught once, or we There's can no- say, huh? <laughs> that's you. No, There's no, no we. I, I'm, I'm, when I say we, I'm saying kind of the, the larger <laughs> MMA community at large. There's a lot of people yeah. who, when John Jones got popped for the PEDs, he he, you know, they were like, "Well, he's probably using them the whole time, and he just got caught this one time." Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I I do know that if he had, I, I still maintain that if he had trace amounts in his system after the Daniel Cormier fight, I I I I, I don't know how they got there, except for one way. And so I, I still maintain that he didn't carry the eye, uh, carry the one, sorry, and, 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 get, and get his calculations right, and he got popped. But that's the fight he got popped on. That's the one that deserves the asterisk. Everything else was clean. And so as long as he's clean, I'm not going to put an asterisk on it. So does his career deserve an asterisk? No, which was the question that we had last week. Does that fight deserve an asterisk? Yes. Because he has to own it, and I All think right. he does. I support it. All right, I can respect that. So, speaking of getting popped with drugs and things like that, USADA, which is the U.S. anti-doping agency, Elias Theodoru, who's the Spartan, he's one of my one of my favorite fighters because I actually got to take a picture with him when I was in Canada. Um, he, 
talked about the fact that he is at a competitive disadvantage uh, with regards to uh, medical use for marijuana and USADA's rules. Uh, basically, he when, before he got into mixed martial arts, he was a skateboarder, and you know skateboarders take lots and lots of spills, and he's got nerve damage from the injuries that he's taken. And so when he's training, he needs the medical marijuana to help him uh, alleviate some of that pain so he can continue to, to train. Uh, but because of USADA's rules, when he gets into competition, he can't use it because then he would get popped for, for marijuana metabolites in his system and he would lose his fights. Uh, so he's fighting that and, uh, he, he thinks he may be able to get a therapeutic use exemption for using medical marijuana. I 100% support that. I mean, it's not like, I mean, he'd use some sort of painkiller and SSRIs no matter what. So why not let this be another option? Exactly. We, we There's too much evidence there for the benefits of a CBD. You know, uh, this should this should be a no brainer to be quite honest, but well, you know, yeah, and I, and I think that, that that when you start looking at people like the Diaz brothers, and you know, I go back all the way to one of the fighters that I loved before he got cut by the UFC, Matt Riddle. Um, these are all people who have used uh, marijuana for for med- medicinal purposes because of different anxieties that they have and other mental issues that that the marijuana has allowed them the ability to, you know, to live you know some sense of normalcy in their lives i mean think about the the diaz brothers specifically i mean as 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 much as we enjoy seeing them talk those guys you know they need to they're not well they're not well <laughs> they're not well they're not <laughs> i i would support further investigation into the use of uh medicinal marijuana um, if there is uh, no benefit yes, to, you can't use them as a as a reason not to because that is clearly CTE effects. Like that, that may have very little to do with the marijuana usage, and more to do with the amount of brain damage. No, no, that, no, 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 no. I'm not saying it, that the marijuana usage caused it. I'm saying oh, that the marijuana usage helps them cope with it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not yeah, I'm not saying anything negative about them. I'm saying that it is a known thing that they use specifically Nick Diaz uses marijuana to help him cope with different mental challenges that he deals with like anxiety and other types of uh you know other other types of mental uh as well as chronic pain he talks about. Yeah. As well as- yeah. So what Theodoro says is that he's tried the painkillers, like you said, the SSRIs, antidepressants, recorded all the results, and you know they have different side effects. So because he's collecting this information, I mean the dude's a smart dude. Um, mm-hmm. He is slowly exhausting all of the other options that the that USADA would place before him, and he's proving that for the pain that he has. In the condition that he has, none of them are as effective as the marijuana treatment. And so it's looking good that he is going to get the therapeutic use exemption at some point with USADA. Interesting. Well, we'll see if that changes things down the road. Yep. Luke Rockhold, you know, we, we Luke Rockhold was supposed to fight Chris Weidman at UFC 230. He had to come out because of a leg injury. Bloody Elbow reported uh, what actually happened and man you know i thought it was just like oh he got kicked in the leg or he sprained his knee or something like that or he you know was walking through a movie a television studio and tripped on a cable and ripped his knee open <laughs> all right let the man <laughs> come on you know i'm not playing it again i know <laughs> but it was one of those funny <laughs> Uh, oh, no, it's two plus two equals four. Dang it! Uh, the uh, they were saying the leg injury. Uh, so this is a quote from Luke Rockle: "The leg injury has been a nightmare, a complete nightmare. It was a misinformed surgery. Unfortunately, I was misguided by a couple of doctors, and I wouldn't say malpractice, but it was a pretty idiotic move to open me up on the blade of my shin where they did, 
and everything I learned thus far. It seemed like a superficial surgery, and that's why I went ahead with it. And sure enough, it's been one of the worst things I've ever dealt with in my life. So I really can't make contact with it. It's on the blade of my shin, and it's such like I was in jeopardy of so many things with this leg and its repercussions. If I were to go out there and this thing opened up and got an infection in the bone. So basically, he got a surgery right on his knee, and if you're a, a kickboxer like he is, you need that shin. It turns out it's important. It turns out it's important. So he couldn't kick. He couldn't use his left leg to kick. And then he got an infection in it. And then when he thought it was getting better, he he opened it up again and it started getting infected again. Uh, and so he tried to keep training, even though he had this infected surgery scar. And he ended up spraining his other knee and getting a broken nose in the process. And that's why yeah. he didn't fight. That's slightly better than the bone spurs, I was thinking. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. so yeah, he had all kinds of bad stuff happen to him. So it's 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 good that he didn't uh didn't fight. Uh but unfortunately for for Chris Weidman, the the Jockery thing didn't quite work out so well. Um Scott Coker, he's the Dana White of Bellator, aka the president of Bellator, our uh our red crested stepchild that we love so much. Um there is a there is a YouTube sensation named Luke Paul who did some YouTube boxing and made tons of cash doing it and has been trying to find his way into MMA for the you know for the longest time. So now he's calling Dylan Dennis out. Which is not a good idea. Mm. No. Uh, uh it's a great idea for the Paul brothers. I mean, they're just out here to make money. Does anyone really take them serious as they're fighting other YouTube fighters? And sure, they they've had some training and uh, they were they they wrestled. Uh, they they can fight a little bit, but they're not professional fighters. This is clearly a money grab, and the fact that Bellator is actually becoming uh, a place for real fighters to land this this demeans the product. And I think several uh, people actually reached out to Scott Coker to let him know that, like, hey, don't give this guy any airtime. You're hurting the sport. Right. They'll still do it, though, because, I mean, the money, I mean, the draws on YouTube for uh, the Jake brothers last uh, I'm sorry, the Paul brothers last fight was ridiculous. Yeah, I think it was like uh, 30 million, huh? Yeah, like, yeah, like YouTube that. fight. That's nuts. Um, so, yeah, the money, it. it it's it's a good move for the money. It's terrible for the promotion. It's like, are you thinking long or short term here? Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, with the UFC and, and the um, experiments they did with people like CM Punk, you know, I think that there is a desire to, to, to try that out with uh, with Luke Paul. Um, on, you know, Scott Coker says, if you have some business you have with my partner, call me. I mean, he's basically said. Send me location. <laughs> so, so if he's serious about uh, it, I, I, I hear you, KC. This is not something that Bellator should be getting into. But gosh, I want to see Dylan Dennis get his hands on Luke Paul. Just want to see it. I feel like I, I have a deep disdain for the Paul brothers. Uh, so, like, yeah, I'd like to see them get beat up, but maybe do it in like. PFL or I don't know. No, no. P- P- PFL, PFL. Let, let's you know. PFL is that. That's I like them. Like, but they're just not on the same level as Bellator or UFC. No, I'm let's just do. saying, if Luke Paul wants a piece of Dylan Dennis, then freaking give him. You know, like yes, yes. Double why with, Dylan with Dennis? S's. I don't know why, but th- he's calling Dylan Dennis out. So. You because if they think Dylan's an uh, easy mark, that's the reason why. Because you know they just saw a guy jump in the air like he's Jean Claude Van Damme and put his foot in Dylan Dan's face. But they get, they don't understand the scope of that man versus Dylan. Habib was whooping up on Dylan Dennis. That's not you know that's not just an average Joe. That's not a tomato can. Okay, that's Habib. Okay, that's the Eagle. All right, then just leave him be. The Paul brothers, it'll take both of them to try and take on Dylan Dana, and they'll both get whooped. I mean, at the same time. It doesn't even have to be a tag match. It could be a two-on-one. Yeah. Okay? So, 
to to make the analogy, you got Luke Paul is like CM Punk, but Dylan Dennis is not Mickey Gall. Yeah, like Dylan Dennis is is legitimately a a, a future champion in Bellator, and and so mm-hmm. yeah, if Luke Paul wants is feel, feeling froggish, let him leap. Let's do it. <laughs> Well, why do we need to see it? Like, if you really exactly. beat them, because I, the gym, they, I don't want to. I'm not paying money to watch they, that. Well, you you probably wouldn't have to because it's Bellator. They would just they would just show it. It wouldn't it wouldn't be a pay per view. I, I, I can Doesn't Bellator have their own little contender series? Don't they have their own little series? Yeah, that no. They could just, just show up on and, and just stick him on a card. Just just do it. And 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 Dylan just needs to be like, okay, listen. I want this fight to go at least two rounds. Give him ten minutes with with Luke Luke Paul and ch- and and change this guy's whole perspective of what MMA is. MMA is not wrestling. MMA is not boxing. And 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 I'm telling you, Dylan Dennis is not that dude that you fought the the little rapper guy that you fought in YouTube fights. Yep. You know well, if you, if if you if you really want to fight a man. Then, then 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 call Scott Coker. He will hook you up. He's your pal. And believe me, Dennis wants all that smoke. Okay? Yes. He wants it all. He wants okay? it all. Because you know? why? Because that's going to be a tremendous platform for him to whoop Luke Paul's butt. But it's not going to be funny. That's the thing. And, and, you know, it's all a big joke to Luke Paul. That's what they do on YouTube. They make funny videos. and And they're funny. And so he thinks, oh, this is going to be a great adventure to put my training and all and talk all the smack against Dylan Dennis. This is going to get real when they lock the cage. So I'm all for it. If you want to go and pet the bear, go for it. Yeah. The bears. Yeah. Go do that. I will watch you. I, I no. will watch you. <laughs> Sp- it's Floyd. Yeah, speaking yeah, speaking oh, of people God. who are going to t- going to pet bears, Floyd Mayweather has announced that he has booked a fight in Ryzen promotion versus twenty year old Tenshin Nasukawa. Oh my goodness. All right. So for for those who don't know, I'm gonna post up a highlight reel of, of Tenshin Nasukawa. This kid is like he is like a prodigy of Kyokan Shinkai. Okay, karate. And he is a devastator. This kid is a rising star in rising. Okay. No pun I don't think this was a smart play. I don't think this was a very smart play for Floyd. I don't know what he's thinking, but if he's thinking he's going to get his butt whooped, he's on the right track. I, I think this is another one of those hubris things. Now, uh, for those of you out there, because we don't ever talk about Ryzen, Ryzen is the, the child of dream which is the child of pride. So when pride was purchased by the UFC, those fighters had to go somewhere that didn't get absorbed into the UFC. They started a new, a new, uh, new promotion called dream that kind of faltered. So now Ryzen is, is what is there and it's starting to get some, they, I think they've had like 14 different oh, cards. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's good. They're, they're really good. They, I, and you know, I'm impressed with Ryzen, you know, they are a big thing. Yep, they are. Uh, Tenshin Nasakawa, like you were saying, he's a prodigy. prodigy. He's undefeated in yeah. kickboxing and MMA. This fight is scheduled for December 31st. Uh, Floyd, I, I read a report that Floyd is, is, is positioned to earn $150 million uh, for this fight. Uh, it's going to have special rules. They haven't said what those special rules are. Uh, my guess is that it's going to look as close to a boxing match as possible. Then it more than likely will be uh, there's a there's a, a a fighting promotion called uh, Karate Infusion, which is sort of like you know they can they they do striking and they can they can clinch, but as soon as you get on the ground, it's like maybe five seconds on the ground, and then you know you got to get back up type deal. So we might be looking at that. I, I don't know. I, th- I I don't I don't think you want to have anything where you have a Muay Thai kickboxer be able to kick Floyd Mayweather in the leg, because I would just kick him in the leg until he he, he quit, because you don't even need to throw yeah. a punch. So I think you probably would have no kicking, you know. And at that point, 
what's the use in taking down if you can only hold, hold them down on the ground for you can't really make any moves in five seconds unless you can go yeah. for an arm bar. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I just think it's going to look like a boxing match. And at that point, I think Floyd, you know, he's 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 the greatest defensive boxer in the history of boxing. So you know, we can see he what happens. He wants to be known as the he wants rules. to be known as the greatest pugilist on the planet. Though well, yeah. that's what he's done it for. But, but he's not going to get that title because you've got to be able to do MMA to be able to get that title. Yeah. And, well, actually, you know, the he, definition of pugilist is what boxing, just boxing, right? <laughs> so uh, I thought, it was, well, okay, we'll go for all. He wants to be known as the greatest fighter. Period. Well, How about that? Not going to happen. Uh, and no, it's not. You know. Not at all. Everyone knows that's George St. Pierre. Yeah. Pugilist, yeah, by the way, yeah, we, we, Pugilist is just a boxer. Um, it's a, just a boxer? Okay. Yeah. So, um, in the wake of the trade between Gegard, I'm uh, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm stealing my thunder here. In the wake of the trade between Eddie Alvarez and, and uh, well, Eddie Alvarez signing with one and then the trade between um, Ben Askren and DJ uh, Demetrius Johnson, Fighters were asked at UFC 230 who else they would like to see traded. Um, so the most popular choice to for the UFC to acquire was Gegard Masasi, which interestingly, they let him go. Mm-hmm. And the most popular fighter to get traded away from the UFC was uh, John and KC's favorite fighter, Colby Covington. <laughs> Nobody wants him. Oh, Nobody wants him, dude. Maybe bare knuckle Maybe fighting championship. Maybe KSW. they don't take him. <laughs> you know, and that's a shame because you know, no, it's not. It's not a shame at all. This guy, he, he's yeah. earned every, he's earned everything that he's gotten so far. So you know, good job there, Kobe. You know, good job. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So I- any thoughts? Who you guys would want to trade for? Or, or trade. I mean, I think we're all happy to trade Colby Covington for someone. But who would you like to see come into the UFC? <sighs> well, it's either uh, Nasakawa. I would love to see him come in. Um, I would love to see. I, I'm kind of torn because there's a part of me that wants Paul Daly back. Or, or no, 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 not Paul Daly. I'm sorry, Michael Venom Page. That's who needs that. He is the he is the one that we need, okay, in the UFC. He's the one. I like that choice. Casey? I would like to bring in Bobby Lashley from Bellator. <laughs> <laughs> Are y'all going to play my man like that? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. And there we go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, it, you know, in the absence of a good idea, any idea will do. Um. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I like I like the I like the Michael Venom page um, one uh, someone else from Bellator and I, I read this on the internet and I thought this was a good one Aaron Pico that dude is a knockout artist and I, the way he's knocking folks out uh, in Bellator they either need to get him better competition or they they really do need to trade him over to the UFC to do some damage because um, you know we, we always joke about the cut the strings off the puppet. That's the guy that mm-hmm. he, he keeps doing it, you know, every single time. Um, I, I, I'd like to see him in the, uh, in, in the UFC. And he fights at 145. So it's a great weight. That's Max Holloway. That's Brian Ortega. That's a great weight for him. Yeah. So that's in the shark tank. Yes. Yeah. All right. So quick hits. Derek Lewis talks Wait, about what, what? Real quick. Yeah. I did figure out who I want to trade from Bellator. Okay. I would like to trade Scott Coker for Dana White. There you go. <laughs> you really stopped me to, to you say ima- that. <laughs> <laughs> but could you imagine with Scott Coker with that much resources? Dude, the you UFC know, traded it, Oh, God. Yes. Yeah. I think I, I have to agree. That's a pretty that's a pretty sound deal right there. Wow. Cricket. <laughs> so, so Derek Lewis talked about why he really took his shorts off. Originally he said that his balls were hot. Um 
But we we learned in the uh, in one of the the media scrums why he really took them off, and I didn't know this about him, but I guess it's something that he does, is that he takes his gloves off, he takes his shorts off, his t-shirt, and he throws it all into the crowd because he's like, I don't care about this stuff, but the fans do, so I just give it to the fans. So he was planning on throwing his shorts into the crowd, and then John uh, and then Joe Rogan asked him about why he took his pants off, and so he just ad libbed. Fair enough. I'm good with that. Yeah. I respect that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think that's really cool. They asked him what he would do with the belt if he uh, if he won against Daniel Cormier. And he said he'd probably throw that in the crowd, too. He's like, but his coach wouldn't be happy with that. So he, he probably wouldn't do it. <laughs> wow. I, uh, that's why I love Derek Lewis. I mean, yes. I love that about him. <laughs> because, you know – you believe him when he says something it's believable his balls were hot yes his balls were hot well let's write that down i would throw the championship belt into the crowd because i don't really care yes he would throw the like it's believable i I like there i like Derek loose about that ufc 25th anniversary coming up this weekend they're going to denver to uh, to celebrate their 25th anniversary i wanted to ask each of you do you have a favorite ufc memory um, I do. I, well, not it's not necessarily. I can remember watching it in my room in in, in Kentucky. You know, um, the first UFC fight. I remember watching those fights and thinking, "Oh my god!" You know, this is blood sport, except it's live. That is live action. It's real and unscripted. You know, and yeah. I, I just I, I was amazed. I was amazed and shocked. At the same time, because up to that moment, I thought the most brutal thing I ever saw was, you know, was the uh, the hardcore circuit of Japanese pro pro wrestling. You know, that was the worst thing I've ever saw at that point. And to to see that, that was that blew my mind at that point. Casey. Um, I'm super partial to when they come to Dallas, so. It's either watching Joanna Young Jacek just absolutely demolish her way to her her belt. Carla Sparza, yeah, uh, yeah, or or the time we met Cain Velasquez down in the elevators, and he was just like a cool dude, and then my boss almost got beat up by Cain Velasquez for hitting on <laughs> his wife. Like, what? Who does that? You can't hit on the heavyweight dude. champion. <laughs> You know, oh my I, I, I've got a ton of favorite UFC memories, a, a ton of knockouts that I, I remember. But if I were to say what my favorite UFC memory is, it's got to go back to what I think is the greatest UFC match in 25 years. And that's Robbie Lawler versus Rory McDonald. I mean, that fight, I will never forget how it was a pitched battle back and forth. I was on the edge of my seat. You know, I was clutching the pearls every time Rory McDonald got punched punched in the nose. And, you know, it was just a fight that I, even to this day, I could go, I could sit down and watch that fight and just be amazed at the resiliency of these trained athletes and, and how they, they kept going despite that Robbie Lawler's lip was split and he shot every time he breathed, it was a shower of blood, you know, like, like who was the wrestler? Who used to spray the uh, the the mist in the air when he got into the ring? Uh, great Muda. Yes. Now that that mist was beer, by the way. That was Stone Cold. <laughs> that that mist was beer, but okay. you know. <laughs> but but anyway, I mean that's the way it looked. So that's that's that uh, that's what I'm going to go in as my favorite UFC memory. But there are a lot of them. Um, but that's that's the one that I'm going to share with you guys tonight. Last story before we go to the fight card and wrap this show up. Ben Askren has an opponent. In waiting, uh, basically, it was reported that there is a contract that is being negotiated between him and ruthless Robbie Lawler. Of course, the connection there with my favorite memory and Robbie Lawler being tapped on the shoulder to be the person to introduce Ben Askren to the talent in the UFC. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, nope. that was the guy that we did not that we did not mention. Uh, when we when uh, the last show when we were talking about who would be his, his, his opponent, 
he was the one person that we did not mention. And it wasn't until after the show that I realized that. And I was going to bring that up to you. But I think you did. Ruthless Robbie Law, did I? Yep. I might have. You, I, I, you know, we've, we've blinked since then. But, uh, you know, with that said, that's going to be a great match. I do feel bad because if anybody's taking the, taking the time to actually look up Ben Askren um, highlights, you'll see this man does not play. He is a mauler, and I would hate to see Robbie Lawler get beat like that. I hate. To, I, I mean, I don't think Robbie Lawler really has an answer to that. Yeah, I don't think so either. Uh, Casey? You know. Uh, I don't like Ben Askren at all, so I hope he loses. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, you could have you eased that in there a little bit. Nope, I'll say the same when we start talking about like the Cerrone. I hope he falls off his horse and lands safely, but falls off his horse. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, you look at it and like the pumpkin and just crush it, man. I mean, you gotta appreciate power like that, man. Yeah, we'll we'll see. We'll see. I I don't have any really really opinion on Ben Askren. You know, um, I think it's a bad matchup with Robbie Lawler. I think that Robbie Lawler is going to be in for a long night. Um, and but I think that it's a great way to get Ben Askren high enough on the ladder to be able to contend with uh, people like Cameron Usman and. Uh, um, Colby Covington. I, I would love to see Ben Askren get his hands on Colby Covington. D- do that. Like, like, let's go Luke Paul and Dylan Dennis on Friday night at Bellator, and then Saturday night Ben Askren versus Colby Covington. Yeah, that's like that's like War Weekend. That's like I'm, you know, I'm gonna go rent a hotel and watch it in a hotel. That's that's how excited <laughs> I'm gonna be. Like, honey, I'm not coming home for two days. Yeah, and Hello, then. Ryan would disappear. We'll never hear from Ryan again. It'll just be me and KC doing the show from that point on. Because <laughs> wow. I can't be just, you know, just to do it. You know, she's on my Hey, hold on. Hold on. I don't know. I don't know if I'm the only one hearing it, but y- y- you sound like there's a glitch in the matrix. And oh like, yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know what's happening right now. But uh, yeah, I don't know yeah. if it was just me or not. Oh, it was like has gone. For those of you who are listening, you know the uh, you know the 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 Cylon that is uh, John <laughs> Keys is is malfunctioning. <laughs> what did I sound like? I don't, I'm about to replay. You listen, listen to the replay. show. You'll hear what you sound like, but you sound better now. That is okay. all from finding the angles. Let's get right into the fight card. Here we go. All right, this is the fight card. This This is is where we look at the fights that are going to happen on this weekend. This is the 25th anniversary show on November 10th in Denver, Colorado. This is the 25th anniversary of the UFC, and they've got a great card uh, planned for that night. First fight of the night, Michael Trezano versus Luis Pena. You've got the Lone Wolf versus Violent Bob Ross. That's a weird name to have, but okay. You, you got to look at his picture. Yeah, he does look like he's painting some happy tree. Okay, he yes. does. I, it, is, it is probably the weirdest, most appropriate name for a fighter we've ever come across. Violent yeah, Pop Ross. He, yes, he, and he brings it. That's the, that's the crazy thing. He really does bring it. Um, UFC has a has a Noob Sabot of his body, but you can look over in the in the little small matchups, and you can see he he looks like a freaking piece of broccoli. Yeah, nice. Afro all right. and all, Afro and all. Macy Barber versus Hannah Cyphers. Um, this all day. You got Macy Barber. I don't know either one of these fighters. Macy's fighting out of Factory X. Oh, no wonder. <laughs> Oh, there, there we go. There we go. Man. If you guys would just find a fight gym and join, you can have these moments. Okay. <laughs> oh, that hurt. That actually. <laughs> so, so uh, the next fight of the night: Joseph Benavides versus Ray Borg. You know what's funny is that I have been calling this guy every name but Joseph Benavides. 
<laughs> Call him John Benavides, James Benavides, George Who's Benavides. <laughs> <laughs> I just call him wow. Benavides because I can't seem to remember his first name. Uh, it's because he wow. changed his hair color. He dyed it blonde. Oh, that's why. Yes. I mean, I guess. Uh, yeah, I go back to your normal hair color and maybe I'll remember your first name. Okay. Jim. Sure. Uh, sure. Ray Borg is the Taz Mexican devil, by the way. Raquel Pennington versus Jermaine de Radami. Uh, the Iron Lady is back. She's been in and out, man. She didn't want to fight uh, Chris Cyborg because of Chris Cyborg's checkered past. Um, and then I think she got hurt. And so she's coming back against Raquel Pennington. I think this is actually going to be a good fight. Uh, uh, Jermaine Randami Randami is, uh, is a great fighter. Raquel Pennington is a durable fighter. Um, I think this is going to be one that's going to have some fireworks. The co-main event. Donald Cowboy Cerrone versus Platinum Mike Perry. Um, mm. I, this is the battle of people that uh, will, will definitely get you uh, get you all. You're going to choose a side on this one. No, I'm not. I'm going to yeah. hope that they both knock each other out simultaneously. I'm going for Donald Cerrone. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, like yeah. Mike Perry. Let, let's just go. Let's just go over the, the list of things that Mike Perry has done. That's just jerk moves. Uh, one, you know, pushing Donald Cerrone out of, uh, out of Jackson Winklejohn. We'll start there Two, okay. the, uh, Oh, I'm 2% African American. So I get to say the N word three, the video that he made of him dressing up as a native American and then using oh, that- a bunch of, a bunch of native American stereotypes to lampoon Donald Cerrone. I, I, that is racist on all kinds. Like, like the, the the first the the African American N word thing, racist. The dressing up as a Native American and doing a whole video, racist. I, I I'm sorry. I, I I cannot support Mike Perry. I don't. I'm. I, if you think it was funny, it really wasn't. And and not I, even, I, I, I not even a little bit. I don't. I, I don't appreciate it. And so. This is one where I'm all on Donald Cerrone, and I would encourage you, Casey, to withhold whatever you have against Cerrone and hope that Cerrone beats the tar out of Mike Perry. Nah, that's the problem, though, is it's this false dichotomy as if they're two separate people. Cowboy Cerrone has had his own racist issues over the last year himself, and so I refuse to trade one one idiot for another. Okay. John. Man up. Uh, I'm just gonna say, you know, this is this is yet one. This is the only like, this is the only fight camp I can think of off the top of my head that's had this issue of them trading one fighter for another. Okay, Diego Diego uh, Sanchez left. Well, oh, oh, I'm sorry, was it George St. Pierre was first, then Rashad Evans. And now we have Cowboy Cerrone. I don't blame the fighters in this. I'm blaming the coaches in the camp for this. I mean, that they keep doing this. Yeah, this is, this when, is becoming a problem. Jackson this is about is, loyalty. Is, is, a, is a pretty – I'm starting to think that it's there's some toxic, toxic, toxicness, toxicity there. Toxicity? I mean, just, think, well, well, just, just think about this, too. That's where John Jones trains, and, you know, yeah. he's had some trouble. And I feel like the camp should do more to keep your fi- their fighters out of trouble. I mean, they're not they're not babysitters, but when you have a champion who supposedly moved from New York down to Santa Fe to keep him out of trouble, freaking keep him out of trouble. You know, and I mean, he moved and he moved up to what Albuquerque. I'm like, don't you watch Cops? Yeah. Okay, Cops, Albuquerque, and Cops. It's like it, that's a that's a regular spot. I mean, goodness, you know, right. don't don't bring with that to Albuquerque of all places. Well, he did that. He moved there because he wanted to stay out of trouble after he got in trouble with uh, drinking and he crashed his car in New York. So it was like, okay, we're going to move back to my camp so I can so I can focus on training. And he just got in more trouble. So I don't know what's yeah. going on there, but guys, get your act together. You used to be the premier camp. Used they to are, be. I still think that they. I, th- I still think they are. They just got too much stuff going on, they and they need, they need some other. They have premier fighters, but their their attitude. Camp. 
is like that of Animal House. Yeah. You don't see this going on in AKA. You sure don't. Not an AKA, not a King's MMA. Not a TriStar. Not, uh, not a TriStar, not a Black Zillion. Well, Black Zillion doesn't exist Black anymore. Zillion. Uh, exactly. They they they, they split to to Henry Hoops. What is it? Three sixty now. I believe yeah. it is. You don't see this at uh, at, at Bang uh, at Bang's camp. No. Well, you don't see uh, it at Factory X. <laughs> and the main event of the evening: the Korean Zombie Chang Sung Jung is going to fight y- Yair Rodriguez El Pantera because Frankie the Edgar answer Edgar uh, had to pull out at the last minute. So I think it's going to be a good fight. Korean Zombie always puts on a good show. El Pantera uh, Yair Rodriguez is you know a dynamic striker, very very athletic. So let's do some flash fight picks. Um, let's go with uh, Donald Cerrone versus Mike Perry. Uh, Cerrone. I got Cerrone. And I'm going to abstain. You're going to abstain. Um, Joseph Benavidez versus Ray Borg. Ooh, that's a good one. I'm actually going to pull for Ray Borg this time. I'm going Borg here myself. All right. I'm going to defect and go with uh, 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 Jim Benavidez. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Fair All enough. right, and Both then enough. in the main event of the, uh, well, let's pick this one too. Ra- Raquel Pennington versus Jermaine Deramy, De Randami. I'm going Rocky on this one. Ooh, I'm going Jermaine. I'm going Jermaine as well. Ooh. And then finally, Chan Sung Jung versus Yair Rodriguez, Korean Zombie versus El Pantera. John, I'm going to go with the Korean Zombie. Same. Same. All right. That is our show. You guys got anything before we go? Be kind, and be kind, guys. All right. Follow us on social media. On Twitter, I'm at CST Ryan. And I am at CST underscore KC. Wow. And I am at Keys to Victory, and that's Keys with the E at. All right, you can check out the website at www.combatsportstalk.com. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Facebook, and Instagram, and Spotify. Uh, We now have merchandise on Amazon. Search for Combat Sports Talk on Amazon. And we have a new section on the website for live events. We did a live event uh, for UFC 230, George, G-Money Stallworth, the double champ, and myself. And we also went live on Facebook. So we went live before the main card on Facebook, and we did uh, about twenty minutes just talking about preview of the fight, and then um, we did the, we did our recording that night. So it was it was really good. Definitely check that out. Um, let's get into the finale. Here we go. Our theme music is composed by Scott McCurry at scottdeancountry.com. KC Onyebuchi produced our lead-ins. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Combat Sports Talk. For KC Onyebuchi and John Keys, I'm Ryan Smith, reminding you to keep your hands up, your chin tucked, and throw balls.